Um, right, hi. So um, my name is Sam. I come from London. Um, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is SecureStep9. Um, so um, who am I? Um, I actually come from a software development background. I'm an ex-developer. Um, moved into application security in 2005. Um, I'm one of the OWASP Blunder chapter leaders. We have two other chapter leaders as well, and one of them, Andrew Litz, is actually um, volunteering at this conference as well. So um, I'm an independent application security consultant. I mainly consult for uh, big banks and financial services companies in London. So I am a defender. So I defend the organization. So what am I doing here? Presenting a tool which has the words network and attacker in them. So here's why. So back in December 2018, I got an email from the project leaders of OWASP and Attacker who were supposed to come to Black Hat Europe 2018 conference in London. And they sent this email saying, dear OWASP London chapter leaders, we're unable to come to London in time and uh, we're speaking. Can you please substitute us and present this project? And we're like, yeah, but we have no idea what this Attacker thing is. Can you tell us? And say, don't worry. We'll, uh, We'll run it by you. We had a conference call with them, and they showed us, they showed the project, they demoed this, and they were like, oh my god, this is really cool. OK, let's go and uh, demonstrate it. And then this happened. We went to Black Hat Europe, and suddenly, because you know, the Arsenal stations, you can see there are lots of other presentations. No one's looking at them. Suddenly, they had lots and lots of crowds gathering, and they were like, this is interesting. There's a huge amount of interest, 2018. And then in 2019, we decided to submit the tool again as a proposal to Black Hat Europe 2019. And then this happened, even bigger crowds. And um, uh, completely unexpectedly. So we were uh, really pleased and started digging more and more into this project. And um, I actually started contributing to this project. And I completely fell in love with it, even though an application security guy said, OK, this is a network security tool. But why is it useful? It, I realized how useful it can be to everyone. So what is it? What is OWASP Netacker? So first of all, of course, just like all OWASP projects, it is an open source software. It's written in Python, and its um, main goal is to help penetration testing, bug bounty, and uh, vulnerability scanning tasks, because it allows you to automate information gathering and vulnerability scanning. So it is written in Python. It supports both Python 2 and Python 3, and because of that, it can run on anything. It can run on Mac OS, it can run on Windows, and can run on Linux, and anything which supports Python. So uh, a bit of history of OWASP Netacker. It was, it's a relatively new project. It was only created two years ago in 2017 by these two guys, by Ali Razbju and uh, Mohammed. Um, and it was originally named named IoT scan because their first idea was to scan IoT devices for vulnerabilities and things like default credentials. Um, these guys were working uh, for a company called ZD Research and they decided to make an, an OWASP project. Um, uh, these are the names of the core developers of uh, NetHacker so far. But the greatest thing which happened to NetHacker happened in 2018 because it was accepted by Google Summer of Code. If you don't know what Google Summer of Code is, it's a a special initiative run by Google every summer where students who are on a summer break get a chance to work on an open source project and get paid for it. And uh, OWASP is actually collaborating with Google and we've been doing it for a number of years. And the students uh, choose the project that they want to work on and enhance it. And that's how NetHacker suddenly got even better. So we had the students working in 2018 and they made it even better. So, what is NetHacker? I like to, you to think of it as a Swiss army knife because it is a tool which consists of many tools and they're not necessarily compatible with each other. But what's cool about this, can they all be used together? So um, uh, it's a collection of tools. It has a modular structure, so there's lots of modules. What's great about NetHacker, it's pretty simple to write your own module. And actually, I wrote my own module for Citrix vulnerability. I'm going to show it to you later on. Um, it's quite fast. It, has, uh, it uses Python's multi-threading, so um, you can actually speed, it, speed up the scanning task by using multi-threading quite a lot. And um, what is great about it, you know, because when you're using Swiss Army Knife, you can sort of pull out different tools, but what if you need to use a bundle of tools? So NetHacker solves this problem because you can create custom profile and you can basically 
uh, group them based on a particular task. For example, you have a profile with all the information gathering uh, tools to be used together, or all the brute forcing tools to be used together. So that's very useful. And of course, the greatest advantage is that automation. So you can automate and run one tool or many tools from one command line, which is, of course, is great, and then get a report. So um, one interesting thing about the Wasn't Attacker, it is not officially released yet. It's not even a beta quality. It has version 001. So we're looking for more contributors. So if you know Python and we'd like to contribute or you have great ideas, please come and join, right? But the great things which this product already has, it's absolutely fantastic. So it has command line interface, web UI, API, generates reports. Uh, for people who use Multigo, it has Multigo transforms, which is absolutely fantastic because you can build very nice graphs in Multigo for investigations. And version 001 comes with 62 modules. And there's plus one, because plus one is the one that uh, was recently added. So um, it has its own page on OWASP.org. So I got the QR code. Obviously, this is the old OWASP website, but there is now a redirection. Those of you who don't know, OWASP now released a new website. Um, so it will take you to the right place. And you can find out from here about all the uh, project contributors, how to download it. And uh, documentation is available on the wiki. So you actually need to go to GitHub and then if you click on wiki, you will find all the various sections on how to install it, how to use it. Um, and uh, there's also a description of all the modules and I'll show you why it is important. Again, I've added a handy QR code for you if you'd like to scan it and uh, jump straight to the URL. Okay, so it is actually an offensive tool. So I need to include a warning, a responsible use warning. So you should not use, um, a uh, invasive tool for scanning sites for which you don't have permission for. So I do need to make sure that you are aware of this. And the first thing that you see when you start NetHacker is a bit confusing because you get this. It's like, what is all this? So this is what I did when I first looked at the NetHacker. I launched it, I saw all this, and I'm like, I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what to use it. I'm not gonna look at it. <laughs> so I walked away and then when the um, project leaders had a call with us and they said, okay, this is what I said, ah, okay, now I get it. Because all these things, these are all the various modules that Netaka can use for scanning. These are all the different blades in that Swiss Army knife. So Netaka has modules, 62 modules, which are, can be split into three different categories. Scan modules, so these are the modules which scan for something. For example, port scan is the most popular module. They have a vuln or vulnerability modules, which are looking for a particular vulnerability. So for example, Apache Struts vulnerability is one of the tools that you can use. And they have a brute forcing. So for example, you can do SSH brute forcing or FTP brute forcing if you, for example, looking to find devices on your network which have default credentials. So I rearranged all, I reformatted that page and put it all on the nice screen here for you so you can see all the scan modules first. You can see there are 21 various scan modules here. And some of the modules I uh, would like to um, bring your attention to. For example, there's a CMS detection scan, which helps you find which content management system is used in your network, a particular IP address. There's a directory scan, which can also can be used to find most popular directories, which can indicate vulnerability. That's pretty standard. ICMP scan is quite good because you can discover all the devices on your network which respond to ICMP, to ping requests. And NetHacker will tell you how many milliseconds it took to scan each device. And uh, there are lots of others. A subdomain scan is another very useful one because that helps you find subdomains very, very quickly. And another one I highlighted here is WordPress version scan which is also quite useful if you want to find old and vulnerable versions of WordPress on your network. So that is also pretty cool. And of course, the main module which is from which NetHacker was started was the port scan because developers were, um, I think, a little bit upset about Nmap because you know everyone has sort of their love and hate relationship with Nmap. And that's why they created this tool and said, let's do it in um, Python. And that's how this project was originally born. So these are the vulnerability modules. There are 30 of them. Again, I put them all on the screen and arrange them all alphabetically. So it is a little bit easier for you to understand. As you can see, there's lots and lots of interesting stuff, interesting vulnerabilities that NetHacker can detect on your network. And uh, 
Yeah, so you can see there's like X powered by, so there's uh, um, uh, self-signed certificates. Uh, server version is the one that I use quite frequently to find all the server banners of all the uh, devices on the network. One very useful one is SSL certificate expired vulnerability. I run it uh, recently on my client's network and I found a whole bunch of devices they had no idea existed because SSL certificates expired. And like, what well, is always? And it's like, oh my God, we forgot about this. We should have decommissioned them. But because certificate expired, they were supposed to uh, patch them, which they, and they didn't. So I think that was very, very useful. So when you go back, I think that's a very useful module for you to take away and use. And there's a new one, Citrix CV 2019-19781, which I added just recently. As you know, there was a Citrix vulnerability recently. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. But look how many tools are there to your disposal. So that's all the vulnerability module, uh, modules. I spoke about scan modules before, but there is more. We, there are also brute force modules. So um, you can brute force using FTP, HTTP basic auth, HTTP form, uh, NTLM, SMTP, SSH, Telnet, and WordPress XML RPC brute forcing as well that you can perform. When you run brute forcing, there is like a built-in list of uh, default usernames and password passwords in the tool itself. You can provide your own list of usernames and passwords you want to brute force with on the command line, or you can load them from external text files. So if you've got a whole bunch of passwords in a text file that you want to brute force a particular device with, then you can do it very easily. Just give it the name of the file, and it will do it for you. So um, I usually run it on Kali Linux, but you can run it on anything. And installing it is pretty straightforward. So usually what you do, you do a git clone uh, from GitHub, and uh, then you can just run, uh, install all the requirements, and then you run python setup.py install, and then you will have NetTacker tool on your um, Kali Linux. So I'm gonna actually do the demo a little bit later, but this is just a single command, you can install it, and it's ready. So this is pretty cool. And um, IoT scan is like the first module there, so the idea is you scan your network to find devices that you have, uh, and you can then port scan them, find out which ports are open, what is running on them, because NetHacker comes with a small signature database, so you can actually detect if you're running SSH on port 20,222 instead of default port 22, or if you're running HTTPS server on some weird port like 9,000 or whatever. And of course, it's fantastic for doing default credential checks as well. So if you have a device with admin admin, or I've recently used NetHacker again um, for a client engagement where they had uh, Cisco devices with default credentials. I don't know how many of you know that recently there was a, a, uh, an issue with uh, hard-coded credentials in Cisco, and it's uh, pretty easy to find using NetHacker. So port scanner is uh, the main module there, and it's quite easy, uh, easy to use and fast. So what you do, you can to use multi-threading, you can add dash T parameter for threads and M uh, dash M to say how many threads per each scan host. And uh, you can also, if you want to scan for a particular port, for example, port 80 across multiple uh, subdomains or multiple IP addresses, you can add dash G and then list the ports that you want to scan. Again, most frequently you want to scan things like port 80 or 443, whichever port you are looking for. For example, if you're looking for RDP vulnerabilities, you will be looking at port 3389. So um, that is the syntax for an attacker. And this is the thing which I didn't know when I ran it for the first time two years ago. I'm like, how do I use it? But this is how you use it. So you need to provide it with two parameters. You need to give an attacker a target. What are you scanning? And you need to give it a method, which tool, which module do you want to use? And you can provide it with an IP address, for example, like this, so to do the port scan of one IP, or you can scan the whole range using CIDR location, the CIDR notation. So uh, these are the various ways how you can define the targets. Um, you can also provide, well, you can provide an IP address, an IP range, starting uh, beginning IP and ending IP address, uh, CIDR range, you can give it a domain, the whole domain, so here I'm using OWASP.org. You can also give it a URL with a protocols like HTTP OWASP.org or HTTPS OWASP.org or a specific URL. So I'm going to show it in the demo a little bit later. And here's how you use it. You use NetTacker. 
uh, with dash L for the list of targets. So this is if you have a file name. So if you want to define on the command line, you would do it with dash I. This is your target. But if you have a list of targets somewhere in a text file, so for example, if your, your organization uh, has several subdomains, for example, if multiple domains or you have multiple IP ranges, it's very useful to create a text file and you put them all there, uh, one on each line. And then once you've got it, it's very easy to scan them all, you just provide a dash L, and that's another way how it can be scanned. And again, you provide the method that you want to scan with, with dash M, and that is the syntax if you want to chain methods, because this is the biggest advantage of this tool. Yes, you have 62 modules inside this tool, uh, but you don't use them one by one. You can combine them. And that's the greatest uh, thing, I think, uh, well, the greatest advantage of this tool, that you can combine multiple modules and you can use them like this. So for example, here, here I'm showing you, you can scan one IP address with a port scan. PMA is phpMyAdmin. You can scan uh, this IP to see if it has uh, phpMyAdmin installed, um, like this. Or you can scan the whole OWASP.org the domain with all its subdomains, you can do subdomain scan, and you can uh, use server version vul vulnerability so you can see how many subdomains of OWASP.org reply with a server version. So um, another thing that before I do a demo, I want to uh, show you another thing that you can do. One of the coolest things with the attacker, you can use all the modules, all 60, 63 modules, you can use them on the target. Of course, it's going to be quite slow. But the thing is, why would you want to use all of them? Because there is a mix of information gathering, there's a mix of scanning for a particular software, and there is a brute forcing, right? So sometimes you want to exclude something. For example, say, I want to run all the modules, but I want to exclude specific modules. And you can do it with dash X. So usually you would specify modules all, and then you say, I want to exclude subdomain scan and FTP brute force, for example. That is also possible to do. And these are the profiles. Of course, it's quite difficult to remember all these modules. Um, and you would want to use them in combination with each other. And that's where the attacker comes with profiles. So these are the default profiles. So you have information gathering, all the scan modules, all the brute force modules, all the vulnerability scanning modules. And they also have, for example, WordPress profile, which will get all the modules about WordPress. So WordPress version scan, WordPress user enumeration, WordPress theme and plugin enumeration, and they all bundled, bundled in the same bundle, or Joomla, or you can have all as well. So if you're using profiles, then the uh, syntax changes. Again, you provide an attacker dash I with your target, but then you do dash dash profile, and for example here, you do information gathering. Um, on the command line, you also have lots of various options, which I'm gonna talk about later, but the ones to, um, uh, highlight is dash u and dash p. So this is where you can provide your user lists for usernames and passwords that you want to brute force particular target with. And there's also API um, that I'm going to show you later on. For those of you who um, uh, like their tools to be multilingual, um, NetHacker comes with several uh, language options available. Um, you can sp switch it to Spanish or to Russian. Uh, or I think there are nine languages available at the moment. Uh, and if you want to add another language, it's pretty easy for you to add. You can change the level of verbosity if you want to see what it's actually doing. And you can log the output into the file. So it supports text, HTML, and JSON output. And it also displays you a graph, which is very, very cool. And I'm going to show this to you in a minute. And another interesting command option here, which was W for wizard. If you don't want to remember any of this stuff, because of course it's quite overwhelming, you can just launch it with dash w for wizard, and it will guide you step by step. It will say, what do you want to scan? How many threads do you want to scan it with? Where do you want to save the results? What do you want to include? What do you want to exclude? So if you just remember dash w for wizard, it's going to be pretty easy, right? So, and these are the graphs that it generates, but if, before it goes to the graphs, I will actually probably skip to the live demo. I'm going to show you the starting of NetTucker. Let's see if this works in my Wi-Fi works. So here I use Kali Linux, right? Okay, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. Right, I hope this is visible at the back. Okay, so this is if I just type NetTucker. 
as you can see, it spits out lots and lots and lots of information. Well, what do they do with all this, right? But as I told you, you don't. Um, you can start it with a wizard like this. One second, let me just resize this a little bit. So, okay, Nutcracker dash W. Yeah, and you can see it's gonna now um, ask you which target do you want and how many threads you want. So I can go and say I want OWASP.org. Oh, I need to type a bit better, OWASP.org. Yeah, uh, 100 threads, thread number per scans five. This is where I want my um, results to be saved. And I'll say, which methods do you want to use? And you can do it step by step. If I go and say, oh, I want to do like a port scan. Yeah, and uh, I can just leave it at none, none, usernames for brute forcing. You get it. And you basically, you can do all this. And then um, once you're finished, there you go. And you can see now it's running the port scan for OWASP.org. Yeah, and it's, you can see it's quite quick. So it only found port 80, port 22, port 443, and 53. And when it finishes, it's going to output it all into a um, uh, JSON and HTML format for you. But obviously, this, this was interactive because, as you can see, I had to type. Of course, the advantage of this tool can be automated. You put it all in the command line. And because the modules are quite easy to remember, because unlike, for example, Nmap command line options, this is all plain English. If you just need to remember, aha, I want to do a port scan, I do a port underscore scan. I want to do a server version vulnerability, I have to find out what are the server versions of all my subdomains. You can do that as well. So let me show you how it can be done. So you can see these are the results. So it shows them in a text format. All right, okay. So this is our OWASP.org. Okay, so um, how to do this from the command line? I'm going to do it from a command line. So I'm going to provide netacker dash i, then the domain name, owasp.org. Okay, and what I'm going to do now, method, which method do I want to use? I'll say I want to use a server version vulnerability. So and that means I'm going to check, connect to the web server and see if it's leaking what is running in its server header. And then I'm going to check um, X powered by header. I want to see if this web server is also leaking the um, X powered by, the X powered by. So you see, it's very easy to remember. Um, okay, I just need to type powered by. Well, like this, yeah. And these are the methods. And I can then define if I want to run it on all the subdomains. So I can add dash s. I can say, okay, run it on all the subdomains. Okay. And I want to actually also then add threads. So I can say, okay, do it in 100 threads. And I want it to run, I don't know, 20, 20 threads per host. Okay. So I hope that Wi Fi works and this live demo works. So as you can see now, it's finding all the subdomains of OWASP.org. Can you see, finding all the leaking server versions. You can do it when you go back to your company, and this is the result. You can see how quick it managed to scan OWASP.org. I used it to scan very large networks, and it's amazing how quickly you can gather all this information. Um, but as you can see here, when it's ended, uh, uh, the, the scan, it Gives, it gives the, um, the last line of the output, says report saved, and it gives you the report. So all the reports are saved in a subfolder called results, and it gives it the date and the timestamp and some random name for the, re for the report. I'm going to open that uh, file to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to copy and paste it and open it in Firefox. Ah, it does the same thing. It's trying to do to wrong URL. I want it to go to slash root. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me try again. My copy pasting skills. Yep. Okay. 
Yep, there you go. So, and you can see it displays this wonderful graph. All right. So this is pretty cool for a free and open source software, right? And you can see what it's done. So it found all the subdomains, done all your server version vulnerability, and then you can see all the port 80 and port 443, and you can see all the vulnerabilities there. All right. So this is pretty, pretty cool. And it, if you're doing multiple methods of scanning, it keeps chaining, keep, keeps showing those in, in this very nice graphical form. And then, of course, if you're a network administrator, right, you want your results in a nice table. You want it probably in Excel. Then you scroll down, and there you go. You've got all your subdomains vulnerable to a particular vulnerability. This is your report with all the ports. You can see which vulnerability uh, this subdomain on IP address was vulnerable for. And, and you can also see here there's a username and password. So when you're doing brute forcing, for example, um, if this thing uh, finds um, a uh, username password uh, which was used to log in, so for example, uh, default credentials, it will actually show you what username and password were successfully used to log in or hack into a vulnerable device. So this is pretty cool. Obviously, you can just copy paste this table into Excel. And there's another pretty simple, but I think finally quite nice uh, special effect. So if you hover over your mouse or a particular row, it actually highlights this one and blurs everything else. So again, you can use it for a presentation if you're presenting it to your board and saying, look, we have vulnerability here. And you can just hover your mouse over there, and it will uh, only display you the one which is vulnerable. So this is pretty cool. Right, let me switch back. And this is the, this was the graph. Um, so there are three types of graphs that you can use with an attacker. So there's a D D3 tree V1 and V2, and also a JIT circle V1 graph. So a circle looks a little bit different. Let me see if I can actually use it. Okay, so I'm going to run the same command, which I just ran. I will close this file. Okay, let's do the same thing. Same attacker, but I will add graph, and I will use this JTI circle v1 graph. So it's doing the same thing now. Okay, done. I'm going to highlight, okay, I'm going to make sure I include the first slash so I can copy paste it into my Firefox a bit better. All right, Firefox. All right. And let's have a look at this graph. There you go. Some people prefer this kind of graph. So there are three different types of graphs currently available, and again, I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool feature. And yeah, it's available for you to use right now. So uh, next thing in Attacker, so this is not all, right? We're just starting. It has an API. So obviously it's a good thing you can see as a command line. You can go and, and scan all your network, all your ranges of IP addresses, find vulnerabilities, find open ports, uh, find WordPress versions. But this thing also has web UI and it also has an API. So if you want to start, uh, use it in API mode, you need to start an attacker with dash dash start API, command line option, right here, and then you specify API host. So this is the um, uh, IP address on which it's gonna be listening. API port is the port number on which you want API to listen. So uh, by default, it's port 5000. And here you can give it an access key. If you don't give it an access key, it will generate one for you, okay? and because the authentication is done using access key, not using credentials. Of course, if you want to put this on your network, so a lot of people, what they do with NetHacker, they run it in API mode, and they create a VP virtual machine, and they run it somewhere on the network. And then whenever people need to connect to it, they can just connect using API web UI, and they can search for the results. And if you want to limit access, because obviously there is no username, password, or credential authentication, it's access key only, then you can define the whitelist of the IP addresses which can connect to it. Okay, so um, this is what it looks like when you start an API. You can, it gives you an API key here. If you don't provide one, it, it automatically generates a random one here for you. And it uses Flask, and it gives you a warning that don't use this for production. 
um, because obviously Flask is not really the web server to be used for production purposes. But all you need to do is basically grab this API key and you provide on which port and IP address you want it to run. And it has this nice interface which looks like this. And what you do, you copy paste your API key in there and then you have a nice web UI. And then you are able to scan with an attacker using this web interface. And instead of going through this massive list of modules available, you just have tick boxes. And you can see here, they're all color coded. So for example, scan is green, vulnerability is red, information gathering is gray, and brute force is orange. So for example, here I tick just vulnerability, one box. So obviously that's the older vulnerability profile. You can see it automatically pre-ticked all the modules of NetTucker, which are vulnerability scanning modules. So that's how it works. And what you can do as well, let me just switch it to, hopefully I can demonstrate it to you. All right, so let me close this. Okay, so obviously this is my virtual machine, which is running um, Kali Linux. I'm just gonna find out what is the IP address. That is the IP address. Okay, I'll just grab it. Okay, and then I'll just type NetTucker dash dash start API. Yeah, and I'll provide it API host equals zero, 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 zero. Let's see if that works. Yeah, you can see it's now running. And as you can see, it generated the, uh, let me see if I can zoom in. Can you see it? So you get the API key. And um, because I provided 00, zero, that means I can connect on any um, IP address, IP interface of my virtual machine. So let me do this. So let me switch back and open the browser. And I go to this URL. Let's see. Which was 192.168.32.17. Is it 177? All right, let me check. I think that was 174. Okay, so 174. 5000. Okay. And before I do that, I really want to grab this API key because obviously that's pre generated for me. So I'm just going to copy that and go back here. No, it still doesn't work. One eight two six eight one three two one seven four. Yeah, there you go. So this is Web UI. So um, live looking at you. And see, I I'm not able to do anything here until I paste the API key because this is how I authenticate. So I paste the API key and said success. You are now authenticated. <laughs> and what we can do here is obviously it has a bit of tutorial, but it has a crawler. So you can see all the results of my scans that I was doing when I was demoing. They're actually available there. And I can click on any of these results and I can see what was what is actually running. There you go, and generates the graph. See, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you can also search, for example, I know OWASP has a subdomain which is called Cheese Monkey. I don't know who created that, but if I search just for the word cheese. Okay, is it cheese monkey? Where's the wiki? Which one is there? Wiki? Is cheese monkey gone? Ah, I think that's gone now. No monkey. But hey, we have wiki and we have what do we have? Harold's test. Oh, we will definitely have wiki. I'll show you the wiki once. Yeah, so see, the, what happens every time you scan with NetTucker, the results go into the database. So the full database is SQLite, but you can imagine, so this is running on your network. It basically provides you with a bit of a, a search engine that you have, and you can, you can look at all the, all the searches. So every time I run the NetTucker, every single session is stored, and it shows you all the uh, options that were actually used, and all the results are available here. So you can simply click on them, so you see, this was the last graph that I used. Yeah, and I can switch back, and I can use, for example, this one. And you remember that one? There you go. It shows you the, the graph, and these are all the results. So after you finish scanning, the results are saved. 
this is very good. Okay, so you know you have them in the database. You know you can always find them with API. And API is not just web UI. You can just use it with, um, of course, for uh, automation with any programming language. You can kind of standard REST API, and it, you, it needs an API token. So the API token it, it generates for you randomly, or you can predefine it when you start the tool. Okay, so let's switch back and. I'll show you a bit more, NetHacker, right? So this is where the database is. So NetHacker creates a subfolder called .owaspNetHacker in your home folder of the user, which is running NetHacker. And as you can see here, there's a NetHacker.db. That's the location of the database. But NetHacker also supports MySQL database, if you'd like to use MySQL. Um, the documentation is available on the wiki. So you can configure it to use MySQL database and um, Quite a lot of companies have their own MySQL cluster database for this kind of data. So every time you do vulnerability scan, the data is saved in the database. Another cool feature of the tool is it has Multigo transform. So those of you who run Multigo and Kali Linux, it's a pretty useful tool for information gathering. And uh, with NetHacker, you can um, add the transforms to your Multigo. You can just import them. And then once you select the target, so here I'm showing OWASP.org again, all the Multigo transforms appear here. Again, you can do all the scans um, that you usually would be able to do using command line. They're available here as Multigo. So there you go. You can just select them. So there's your subdomain scan. This is what it looks like in Multigo. So if you use Multigo, it's very, very useful. Um, so Citrix vulnerability. So two weeks ago, the entire world was shaken by this new vulnerability because lots of people use Citrix devices and this vulnerability it was a remote code execution vulnerability. That means that hackers could access your network using your Citrix uh, Netscaler gateways, uh, VPN gateways, uh, which are the devices were supposed to be gatekeepers into your company. And suddenly, uh, it actually um, um, uh, was used to attack your network. So what do you do, right? So um, everywhere in the news, uh, Citrix vulnerability, uh, how to scan for this vulnerability. So there was a particular way to find this using uh, exploitation of the directory traversal vulnerability. Uh, it was dot dot slash VPNs, I think. So the, the, there are two commands that you had to do. But the thing is you can do it on one IP address. And I think some companies started releasing tools to scan one IP address. But most companies I know, including some of my customers, they're on multiple Citrix devices. And the problem is some of them didn't even know where these Citrix devices are. What, what are their IP addresses? Some of them even had expired SSL certificates and were left untouched and abandoned uh, for, for a period of time. So um, this is my tweet on January the 10th when I actually said, OK, this is actually a perfect example how I can use OWASP NetHacker. So I wrote a module, um, the 63rd module, which is called Citrix CVE 2019-19781. And this is what it looks like. And I scanned uh, several networks and I found <coughs> Dozens and dozens and dozens of vulnerable devices using this. So, because you can give it a range of IPs, I uh, scanned my customer's network, which had 10,000 servers on it, and found nine vulnerable servers straight away within uh, within seconds. And this is the command that you can use. Again, you provide NetHacker with a target, um, you define the IP range, and this is the module, Citrix CV 2019-19781 vulnerability. So, this was very very useful. So. Output, of course, because this tool is used for automation. The great advantage of it, when it finishes, it produces results, not just in HTML, not just in the graph form that you've seen, but also in JSON format, which means it's machine readable, and you can integrate the attacker with other tools. And to get the um, JSON output, you just do a dash O uh, and the command line, and you specify the file name of your report. And obviously, you've seen the text output, which looks like this. And this is the JSON output, which is very useful. Uh, I think we've done the demo. So uh, you can also provide extra uh, parameters to each method. For example, you can define which ports um, you want to use, which passwords you want to use, which users you want to use. So there's lots of options that you can also add. So there's actually screens and screens of, all, of options. So for every single module, they come with several options. Again, you, if you, you can um, check. Uh, on the wiki, they're all documented there. So 
um, it's not just, for example, when you're doing a um, server version scan or x by scan, by default, it only scans port 80 and port 443. For example, if you know you have web servers running on port 8000 or 9000, if you want the attacker to scan those ports as well, when it's looking for web servers, you can just add them here and additional options. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about something called OWASP A0. We know OWASP top 10, so A1 today, what is A0? So <laughs> there's the tweet from Jeremiah Grossman, the uh, CTO of uh, White Hat, said, okay, I suggest OWASP top 10 includes A0, asset inventory. These days, the biggest risks are the websites you don't know you own, right? So there you go, and obviously there is no, um, uh, asset inventory in OWASP Top 10, but it exists in CIS Top 20 controls. So that's where you find all the inventory. If you don't know uh, CIS Top 20, uh, that's where you find them. And you can see if you have a task of securing your network, these are all the various things you have to do, right? So there's a basic, there's foundational controls, there's organization. You can see application software security, where OWASP is, is number 18 on this list. So these are all the things you need to do before when you start getting to AppSec. So that's why inventory is actually number one under basic CIS controls. So OWASP and attacker is great because the number one use case is asset discovery. What do you own? What do you have on your network? You can just easily scan it. You can scan the network for open ports. You can scan it for new hosts. Scan your network for default credentials. How many websites or servers or devices or cameras that you got, IoT cameras or ring doorbells, have admin admin as default credentials. Do you know, how can you scan thousands of them in one minute and find out? Use NetTacker, right? You can monitor your subdomains and open ports on them. You can monitor expired certificates in your IP address ranges. Find subdomains hosting vulnerable versions of WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. That's what I used it for recently, and it's absolutely great. So I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna give you some useful commands to take away, right? Um, command number one, find all subdomains of your company and grab server banners. Use this command, server version vulnerability and X powered by. Uh, next one is find web services on your network um, and grab banners. If you, do it, if you, if you know the IP, IP ranges, you can do it based on the IP ranges instead of the subdomain. So same thing, but use the IP. Yep, yeah, there you go. One command line, free open source tool. Don't need to go and buy expensive tools from vendors. We can do it from OWASP. Um, uh, project. There you go. And this is the one to find all the expired SSL certificates. So I scanned about 20,000 IP addresses within minutes and I found a whole bunch of expired certificates using this command. And again, please note the multi-threading. So make sure you add threads. And again, it depends on how much RAM you have on your machine, how many threads it's actually able to run. So it's a bit of experimentation, but if you start with this command, that's actually good. That means that it will launch 100 threads. So if you're scanning, for example, a network with 255 IP addresses, it will scan 100 of them first and another 100. And on each uh, of the hosts inside of them will uh, launch 50 threads per each host to scan for a particular vulnerability. There's another one I want to uh, leave with you. It's a detect WordPress version on your subdomains. Again, you give it your company.com, subdomain scan and WordPress version scan. Again, 100 threads to make sure that the, it's, the process works a bit faster. And here's the last one. Check if any SSH servers on your network have admin admin credentials. Again, so what you do is SSH brute. So this is a brute force. So I had no time to speak about brute forces. But say, I want to do a brute force using SSH. Username admin, password admin. And I want to try it on my entire class C IP range network. And within minutes, you'll find out if you have any hosts which respond to admin admin credentials. Um, another cool thing uh, that you can use is something called serverless scans. So this is a thing that you can utilize the build pipeline, which are offered by some networks. For example, by, by Azure DevOps, uh, you can use GitHub Actions, you can use Travis CI, whatever. Because this tool is written in Python, what you can do in a build pipeline, you can start a shell script, then you can say, okay, go and download. You can see what it's doing here. So it's gonna go and download the NetTucker and it starts started versus a target. And when it's finished, it saves the results in the same repo. So you don't even need a server to run it. You can just run it in a pipeline, completely serverless. So we need developers, please contribute. If you know Python, uh, you can help us write documentation as well. 
So these are the developer guidelines. We need developers, please. So we want to bring this project from its current state into a more releasable state. Um, and yeah, please read the guidelines. And one thing I forgot to mention, Attacker actually comes with its own logo. You know, OS projects as tools, they do come with logos. And that is the logo, if you see this. That's our logo, and that's the URL to contribute. Um, please help us. And this is it. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you, Sam. Um, if uh, we have any questions. Thanks, Sam. Uh, my question is related to scanning for the application vulnerabilities. How far do you think this tool is helpful in that area? OK, so it will scan for, um, if I go back to the, maybe quicker to the um, vulnerabilities list here. So it will scan for like basic things. Uh, right, for, like for example, X powered by XSS header being missing, right? Um, uh, course policy and the options method enabled. So it's basic things that they can check or directory, sub, uh, directory scan. Um, so there are already methods in there, but the thing is, it's pretty easy to write a module which can do it. So um, these are the uh, current um, modules which are there, available to, to scan for the vulnerabilities. Um, there are quite a few of them, but they're, they're pretty basic. So for example, when it says XSS, so it doesn't actually scan the website for cross-site scripting. It just checks if the XSS protection header is present in the response. Okay. Hey Sam, thanks. I was wondering how good is the direct the uh, subdomain enumeration versus dedicated tools? It, can we rely on it exclusively, or do you use other tools and feed that information sometimes you, to an attacker? OK, good question. So you can actually use both. So it, there are various uh, sources for subdomain enumeration. They're all passive. And um, actually, we're improving that as well. Uh, but if you have nothing, right? So if you go back to your organization and say, I don't know how to find my subdomains, you can use this to get it straight away. So it uses things like certificate transparency logs and some other passive data uh, sources to find it. So if it's not as exhaustive as uh, tools which do brute forcing of the names, for example, but I usually combine it. So I use its uh, subdomain scanner, but I also use some other scanners from other tools, right? And I get a list of subdomains, so you can just feed it into this tool as well. So you can use both. Thanks. Would there be a useful module that would pull down stuff from the internet, like go and pulling out a particular Citrix thing? Well, that's kind of a pain, but like pulling in some like XML -E, JSON -E type something or other and just iterating through it and just running all the Citrix possibilities. So you could just dump them in a website, right? And it, you'd say run all Citrix things, pull them down, run all the stuff. So you could just update your thing and get pulled down real time. Uh, like a module. Up, up in real time. Yeah, so you uh, just push it out and just get pulled down. Yeah, but as you can kind of achieve it because if you use that serverless scanner that I suggested, so basically if you do a build pipeline where you just run it and you can just run it, let's say, every 10 minutes. And obviously because it will uh, store the results in JSON, you, what you can do as well with a serverless integration because you, if you uh, do a git push and you commit the results back in the repository, you can just do a, a diff between two different builds. So as soon as something changes, for example, it found a, a new vulnerable host, you will uh, notice that there, uh, there's a difference in the JSON file because suddenly it's bigger size and you can monitor that. So there is no monitoring, but I, I get to say we, we, can, we can work on that and add it. That's a very useful suggestion. Okay, no other questions? All right, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you.